Okay, Lori, we're recording. Okay. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm excited about being here with you, Anna, and and I loved your um, invitation when when you sent me that that email and you asked if you could interview me. I I loved that your your second line. You know, it's it sounded kind of. Uh, of can the first line and then second line i've been part of following your tribe for quite some time i love your work and the level of inspiration you give women all over the world and i thought oh my god she's really like she knows who i am and yeah. then you know i think your values are a perfect fit for the women's community that i service i'm looking forward to powerful women like you to showcase on my interview series and that that was and then you know you gave me the purpose of the summit and stuff and those two lines especially the first one but those two lines are, are why i said yes um, I think I just said you bet or something like yes, that. Yes, I like, love that. It was that in the was middle it. of the day. <laughs> and that's so, what you are. You have you're the diva. Well, I think you know one of my one of my hashtags is keep it real, which has taken on a life of its own. But it's life, you know. And 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 a lot of times I've heard people say, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. But then you're in the corporate world, and you kind of have to. You know, to take. But you don't take yourself seriously, but you take the situation seriously, right? And I think that there's a differentiation there. And I, and I think that, that by the same token, that when you um you know, you keep it real to maintain some level of humanity and fragility and power and all of the things that you bring as a human being, but also as a woman. And and um, I told you already, we started chatting before you we started recording. And and the the one of my mentors who, you know, I, I showed up in this law firm, literally all men, and, and one day I, I ran out of pantyhose when, you know, I still wore those things. And I, I wore slacks, and they wanted to send me home. And I was like, A, nobody else in the office, everybody else in the office wears slacks, and B, nobody else knows how to use the switchboard. So you can't no. send me. So, and they, they had to let me say because I was right. Nobody else knew how to run the switchboard. But then they kind of, you know, it allowed me to make some breaks um, in the um, in the thing. Now, they wanted a professional atmosphere, and they wanted professional dress and business dress. But you can dress in a business outfit in slacks as a woman. And and back in the early 90s, that just was like, wow. Oh, no. I mean, it hadn't been that long since Dolly Parton's 9 to 5 movie had been out. <laughs> <laughs> and you were rocking the boat already. <laughs> so, you know, that that whole thing, though, of, of doing what you can when you can, um, I've, got, um, I've got a couple colleagues who I deeply admire um, who are – who are a sound sounding board for me and who are a sound check actually about four people now three men and a, and a woman and um and they tell me if i sound um harsh passive aggressive um you know laura you need a sound check you're not ready for prime time and stuff because i have rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia and when the pain levels increase it's really hard for me to emote in an email and so i tend to be very straight to the point and here's what you need to know and and to people who know me that comes across as harsh because I haven't put anything in there that I typically do um that that either softens the message or lets them know I understand how they feel but here's how we have to handle this and here's why um it's just here are the facts deal with it you know what I said oh, yeah. that's right and I and I'll get a note back or a text message or something on Skype um Lori cool off a little <laughs> Calm it down. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and that's the thing. So many women are so busy taking care of other people, the family, yeah. their husbands, their their colleagues, their their coworkers, their, their, a lot of times their, their direct reports, that they don't take care of themselves. And you have got to take care of yourself and invest in yourself so that you're worth more to others. If you truly care about the people around you, you will do the things that you need to do to maintain your sanity and your level of energy to be able to continue to do those things that you love and the service that you are passionate about performing. So, you know, having um, a reflexologist come over once a week who, I mean, she she comes to me. It's not like I have to go anywhere. Um right. You know, having um, having a um, an adjustment or a massage or going to the doctor or, or taking pain meds or not taking pain meds or doing whatever I have to do to um, maintain my level of performance that I hold myself to. Correct. If I can't do that, 
and I have to step away. So I, I've been known to, I need a couple of minutes, go to the other room and sit down on the couch, and an hour and a half later, I'm still trying to stand up. Um, you know, I just can't move because I'm so drained and exhausted, and, and that's not good for anybody. How can I help anybody sitting on the couch being exhausted? How can I, how can I um, promote the brand, or how can I make a difference in someone's life if I haven't made any investment in myself? Um, and so I think to break through the glass ceiling, we need to have some different tools in our toolbox than we've been told about. Oh, I love that. Do you have any that you want to share with us and the listeners that um, have helped you? I have a hammer, and it's a velvet hammer. That's awesome. uh, or so I've been told. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> I I have – well, there was a situation. So here, here here's an example. There was a situation where we were talking with someone – about a strategic partnership and we were talking about the trial and then the trial was going to move forward but we were going to do the trial on a very limited trial and then expand the trial and then you know talk about what that strategic partnership would look like because we weren't going to talk about what the strategic partnership would look like and nothing was indeed signed until after the second trial you would think that nobody would start talking about a strategic partnership or in fact being in one until we actually had one. Um, and, and she put on her LinkedIn, she had a LinkedIn showcase page that she changed the name of to say, you know, strategic partner of, and, um, and I was like, Oh my God, I can't, I can't believe she did that. I mean, I, I we, I, hmm, I still am tongue tied about it. Oh, I mean, what are you thinking? You don't have a strategic partnership. You can't go out and promote something you don't have. People right. will call you a liar. So in order to protect our brand and in order to protect our relationship and the sanctity of the relationship and, and the clarity of what, you know, doing those pilots and, and what, we're can, what we're putting out to our members or, or to our stakeholders about what we're doing, I can't let that go. And, and it's my responsibility to do something about it. So um, as a branding officer, right, so I sent her a message, and I blind copied the our, our – or I copied our CEO and, and legal counsel and the person on our team who was responsible for the pilots and things. And I said, look, um, I see – I came across your showcase page today. And I need to let you know, I need to inform you that this is a violation of our of our brand and trademark, um, uh, uh, the trademark of our brand, which is certified and blah, blah, blah. And I give you the number and all that, you know, formal stuff that you have to convey. Right. And I said, you know, look, we're really looking forward to working with you. And we're hoping that the trial works well. We're doing everything we can and investing more than we would for anybody else to make this a success. And we cannot have you posting or talking in public about anything that has not yet transpired, and and certainly not until you have formal approval. And so you need to take this down and take it down today, or I'll have to file a trademark infringement against you with LinkedIn. And um and and it came down, and and the CEO replied like, you know, I mean, it, it was it was, and and I oh by the way, I can't wait to meet you at the convention in, <laughs> in a couple of weeks, and I'm you know I'm really looking forward to it, and. And so I kind of, you know, softened the blow where I could, but I had to be formal where I had to be formal because our brand depended on it. I've got to protect who we are, or who I am, right? And and I want to maintain the relationship. I don't want it to disintegrate because she jumped the gun. And right. and so my making the assumption that she jumped the gun, but she did it, you know, without recognizing what that meant or or the cost, is, right? And um, and so that that kind of a thing really um, allowed me to shatter um, my glass ceiling and and be sought after by other by the CEO and other people in the organization that that said you know if you've got a problem <laughs> with someone um, a Lori's going to protect the brand like a bulldog <laughs> and b she's going to snuggle up to the person she's talking to like a little warm kitten. Um, and be the velvet hammer. And and so, I mean, it, it goes back to taking yourself serious. Don't take yourself seriously, right? Right. 
be human, recognize your frailties, recognize your, your, your power and your passion, but take the situation seriously because if, if you allow one person to infringe on your brand, you have to allow everybody else to infringe on your brand. And honest to God, my comment was, I can't sleep with that many people in one lifetime. No. And it, it cracked everybody up in the board meeting, but I was, <laughs> you know, it sort of gave, I, maybe it gave them a picture they shouldn't have had. But going back to, you know, sweet branding, um, it, it certainly gave people some sense of, of um, a, a um, you know, you try and give people some perspective. And Correct. it certainly gave them perspective of the amount of time it would take to get out of bed with everybody we were in bed with that we had let come into our bed. We don't want to sleep with that. And and all of a sudden, everybody that I was talking to in the room when I'm giving this report said, you know, are thinking. You can see it go across their face, let alone like, oh, oh, an aha moment. Right? Like, I can't think, I can't sleep with that many people. And then, of course, <laughs> Then comes the moment where everybody in the room is sort of turning pink in the cheeks because they oh, didn't okay. have that thought, right? And so it's kind of like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know um, how I, I'm allowed to continue to to communicate with other corporate folks and other co- uh, companies and stuff because I, I don't have a corporate speak, but um, I do, but I don't. You know, it, right. it's much more feminine. Um I think, like I told you, I mean, when you sent that request, uh, you know, uh, talking about the purpose of your summit being to um, inspire women to dig deep within themselves and manifest their dreams, hearts, desires, and cultivating abundance, right? That that really speaks to it. What is it you want out of life? And don't don't allow yourself. Don't. It, it, it's incumbent upon each one of us mm-hmm. to dig deep and manifest our dreams and our heart's desires, and, and by doing so, to manifest our children's dreams and their heart's desires and cultivating abundance in them and in our community and in our friend circle and in our workplace. If we allow ourselves to be drained other people will be, wow, that was heroic, that was a great effort, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. Right. Right. And we have no legacy then. All we have is a memory that people will forget when, you know, unless you're Mother Teresa. And the thing is, when you bring up the Mother Teresa example, there is no other example. There, there's that. That's it. There's, there's nobody like her in the world. Stop trying to be her. So, so if you are volunteering with an organization and you don't get anything from it, personally or professionally, you do a disservice to that organization because other people who might have volunteered would look at you and say, wow, it's great that she dedicated her life to that, but I, I, I've got kids, I've got responsibilities, I just can't do that. But if you do gain something personally and professionally, other people are going to be like, oh, my God, I should do that too because I need a jump in my career. I need a mentor. I need this personal fulfillment of being a soccer coach, of serving on a professional board, of, of working with JA, you know, uh, Junior Achievement, or with, with Alpha, or with, um, you know, the, the Colorado Arts um, community. I, I believe in that, and here's a way that I can do something I believe in and, um, and it move my life dreams forward at the same time, or move something forward for my family, or for my employer, or, you know, whatever that, that what is it you want back out of it? Right. Is, are are you volunteering because you're looking to learn skills that will advance your career? That's the best and and biggest reason people volunteer, volunteer is because they can't get those skills somewhere else. You can't get a job until you have the skills, and you you can't right. get the skills until you have the job. So get a job with somebody who's grateful to have you, and and commit to them, and do what you say you're going to do, and and. And also keep it real and say, look, I've got three kids. I've got, I've got to be able to do this. I, I've, one of my one of my coolest volunteers is a um, uh, currently where I work with Alpha now, uh, which is the Association of Latino Professionals for America. Okay. Uh, one, of my, one of my volunteers is a mom, and she works um, she works sixty hours a week. She's got two kids. 
they're both in school and she works early morning so her husband drops the kids off at school she comes home and she's home for about an hour every day before the kids come home and she uses that time to kind of straighten up and and, and stuff and she said but then the kids came home and it would be chaos again and i realized that i was straightened up for myself and I had nothing to show for it. So she volunteered because she wanted something to show for the time that she had before her kids got home. And it certainly was not going to continue to be straightening up the house because that was a losing battle. So right. she writes for us and and helps me with um, creating social content and creating some things. I send her um, articles that come in. Um, you know, People want to submit for our blog. Our mission is to empower and develop Latino men and women as leaders of character for the nation in every sector of the global economy. So people write to that and they speak to that. How can we um, empower and develop leaders in the fastest growing demographic in our country? Right? And so she helps with editing and, and things like that. And it might take her You know, I don't send her a lot of stuff. It might take her 15 minutes, but that 15 minutes is then showcased um, in better quality content on our on our news page, on our blog, out in in social, in our newsletter, and um, and she's my secret weapon. Nobody knows she exists. Um, And she all she got that by stepping out of the box. Yes, and realizing that something she needed to do something for herself but she needed to do something for herself that had lasting value, right? And so when I'm on conference calls, like I'm not doing it right now because I want to fully, completely focus on you and on, on what we're doing today. But, you know, there there are times that I'm on conference calls where I'm not a primary participant in the call. So I put my – I've got a, a wireless headset, a Bluetooth headset. I call in on Skype and stuff. And, and so um, I'm connected on the computer, and I'll put myself on mute and go walk around the house and straighten up. Oh, yeah. I'm so there. <laughs> and send out oh, emails and do all kinds yeah. of different things. Yeah. And now everybody knows that I work from home, which is great because the dog barks when you're in the middle. So Exactly. Uh, I'm, yeah. I have mine in the cage right now because he wants to act up. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, and, and so I think that, you know, there is an opportunity for women to not genericize themselves in order to advance in the corporate world. You don't have to put your hair up in a bun and, um, you know, no dangling earrings. And and I mean, like, obviously not. Like, don't, well, I say don't show up to work like a hippie, but I certainly do. So um, although my sister helped me get some new clothes and stuff, and they're all kind of naval, navy, you know, um, boat type, whatever. Oh, cute stuff for the nautical type. Yeah, nautical, that's the word. And, And actually... My picture on my Facebook page, I'm wearing one of the top. I love it. The We're outfit. friends now. Yeah. I, yes, and I saw your friend request come through. It was so cool. Yay. I have to I have to unfriend people or wait because some people unfriend me. Not, I don't know if I offend them or if they just, well, I don't. Lori doesn't talk to me much or whatever. But, I mean, I've got 5,000 friends, so I can't Oh, talk well, to yeah, them. exactly. And, like, how do you I talk to all of them? Like, how do you be in bed with all of them? <laughs> so what's interesting is I really want to hear from people. You know, so so – the the whole idea of of maintaining your femininity i mean if you think about it there is a lot of talk and, and work around diversity there are diversity and inclusion officers who are reporting to the ceo or reporting to the chief human resource officer um in, in global companies right and they're they're looking how do we diversify our workforce i i got one call um at alpha from a uh, from an, a um, mutual insurance company, which is the kind that are like owned by their owners, you know, the oh, yeah. UK and and like um, a franchisee type thing. Well, no, sort of like um, Woodman of the World and oh, okay. Hospital and, and stuff. So where it's a it's owned by the policyholders, and they're based in the Midwest. And they said all of our, uh, in in essence, he said all of our clients are Nordic, you know, white blonde haired blue eyed people who who you know because they were they were founded in minnesota and and you know that's kind of what the type of people that moved to minnesota i mean who else in their right mind would move to minnesota and enjoy the winters um I, and i spent a winter in minnesota so i can say that now but um i 
I'm thinking, okay, so you've got to diversify. But but what I'm seeing is it's not just about uh, diversity is not just about the color of your skin, the language you speak, the culture that you live, but also about um, diversity of thought. You can get a lot of people in the room together who all golf, and all of a sudden you have no diversity in the room if golf is the topic, um, unless fine. you have people who play different kinds of golf, that play on different golf courses, that maybe there are people who don't play golf, but they're involved in the development of golf courses or in the hospitality side of now you're getting diversity of thought. Or how about people who don't golf at all, but maybe they're into soccer and they want to bring a different perspective to the group. Um, you know, so so walking into a leadership circle that is primarily men, walking into a boardroom that, you know, where no one else um, had, well, um, hmm. How do I uh, say this? Um, they, w- they wouldn't wear skirts out in public, um, you know, where where it's fully men. They're not looking for you to genericize yourself and and to um, to kind of white label yourself as as one of the guys. Right. You know, I mean, exactly. So so they're looking for that diversity of thought. So. What kind of perspective? Some of my best friends that are executives have such cool. Um, they love to read. They they um, they do. They they create their own diversity of thought by what they consume. Right? It, the marketers. I've got one uh, friend of mine who's a chief marketing officer. Um, or oh, she was a chief marketing officer. Now she is a chief innovations officer, and coolest woman on the planet. And she she doesn't just read marketing material. She reads tech. She reads finance. She reads a lot of different things to kind of get a broader scope. And she likes to hire people who have a college degree in a liberal arts, you know, history, English, political science, you know, different things like that, where you're more well read. Whereas with business or science or technology, your um, your post, you know, your secondary, um, your education in college is very focused on those skills right. because they're so hard to learn. So I think people, everybody ought to have at least a year of liberal arts. But anyway, um, I I think of of people like Maya Angelou, who said things like, so think about think about this. She said. People will not remember what you said. They will not remember what you did. They will remember how you made them feel. I want people to think about how I made them feel. I want to impact the way they feel about me after I've left the room. Are, are they are they still going? To, if I give them a good feeling in the room, but I leave the room and they think differently of me, or, or are they still going to think well of me and, and want me to come back and, in fact, invite me back or pick up the phone and say, hey, I've missed you or send me a text message? And I swear to God, there's some days I get 150 text messages, but I get to see them. But what is it, you know, about people who follow me on social media and develop a relationship with me and and become my friend or I become their friend is probably a better way of saying it. And and on my side of the equation, I don't even know they exist. Right. I, I've i walked into meetings where someone has referred me because they've been following me for a while, and I've had them introduce me better than people who who have a script in front of them and, and more accurately than I could have introduced myself um, because they knew what was important to the people in the room because they were part of that audience, part of that community, and they knew the value that I could bring to that community because that's why they asked me to be there. And it never, ever fails. That's happened on more than a dozen occasions. And it's always um, a clear cut of what's important to the people in the room. So on that note, if you think about how to represent yourself in social media, think about who your audience is. and talk to the audience members that you really want to serve more of and and get to know some of them or or ask the people in that audience who already know you what about me is most important to you if you were going to introduce me to someone in your 
in your company or in your industry or at a convention or conference that you were going to, how would you introduce me and what would be important for you to convey to other people about me? Mm-hmm. That's what you start with to come up with your LinkedIn summary. That's amazing because a lot of people don't even know where to start. Right. Right. What do I say about myself? I don't even know where to start. I ask people, you know, I mean, I I had a great LinkedIn summary before, and then I took a corporate job, and I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what to say. I I can't say the same things I did say because it's a different audience. And it, it took maybe three months for me to kind of refine it and still it's very it's 2000 characters to to the limit but it it's still i'm 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 wishing i could make little tweaks here and there and i i may do that there are a few people that have gotten to know me now over the last year where i might just reach out to them and say how how would you make this better now the challenge is they're going to come back and and it'll be 2100 characters and linkedin only allows you 2000 and you have to think of what am i going to get rid of yeah, but once once you've got that done, you've got your Twitter bio, you've got your um, Instagram bio, you've got your Facebook about me, um, you know, about dot me. It, it, it kind of, that's the, the core. That's your introduction, your elevator speech, your when you walk in the room and meet somebody and you, it's the perfect person standing in front of you. What If you couldn't make any mistakes, what would you say to them? That's your LinkedIn summary. And from there, you launch all your other introductions because, the LinkedIn is first person conversational. It's the core of who you are. And then, then you can then you can go out to the rest of them and you can say different things on different platforms and still be consistent. So if people find you from one platform to the next, they recognize who you are and feel right. like they've a little bit more about you. Right. And that's I mean, I found you on LinkedIn. Cool. And you're the LinkedIn diva. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> You know who gave me that? No, uh, who? Moniker, uh, a friend of mine called uh, his his moniker is the sales heretic, Don Cooper, and um, he he is a speaker um, at sales conferences and stuff. And and way back in the day, in like 2009, my former partner uh, Mike O'Neill and I were starting to speak together as a team, and we would have two people on stage, and that was different. And so Don came over to help us develop our, uh, redevelop our, our speaker material and, and the one sheet and the information about us and all that kind of stuff. And he asked a question. He was like, okay, so Lori, when you guys, when you and Mike are on stage, you're the LinkedIn rock stars. And when Mike is on stage by himself, he's the LinkedIn rock star. He said, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm just Lori. And he said, no, that's not good enough. And I was like, oh, hold, hold, hold on, hold your horses. What do you mean that's not good enough being just, <laughs> How can I, how can I, and, and I was like, dumbfounded. I still can't even get to a whole sentence. You know, what do you mean that's not good enough? And he's like, well, who would who would be good enough to to be the partner of a rock star? And and he was looking at it as equals, right? Because when we get on stage, we um, we give and take. We might talk at the same time. I might stand in the background while Mike moves forward and talks, or I'd I'd move forward and he'd step. You know, he would back up a couple steps, and it was very natural and, and gave the audience some visual clues as to who they should be listening to and, and where their eyes should land. And then every now and then we'd go together to the front and have a good back and forth, and um, and get the audience engaged in who was right, um, which was always fun. But he was like, well, who would be an equal to a rock star? And he's the one who came up with the LinkedIn Diva. And he's like, that's it. You're the LinkedIn Yay. Diva. He I was love so it. Excited. And he loved it. And he believed it. And Mike, I, I turn around and look at Mike to see where he went. And he's sitting at the desk. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, that's a great name. I want to see if you can back it up. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> what do you mean? So here's my partner who doesn't believe in me. And I'm like, what do you mean I got to back it up? And that's when, uh, that's when he I'll found out. Yeah. But I was the ninth most connected woman on LinkedIn at that time. And I thought, well, that's great. Now, how do I um, – and and this is important for your listeners because if they're going to change the perception of what people think about who they are and what they are all about and where their value is, they've got to think about how to reposition themselves in their community, within their family, um, within their church, um, to start speaking differently about who you are and what you're about, and that in turn – um, helps other people think differently about you too, and then your reality begins to change and begins to become the reality that you're really looking for your life to be. 
And so, um, no, it was great that I was the ninth most connected woman on LinkedIn, and I put that on my LinkedIn profile. But I thought, that's, I that. who are the others? Who else is there? Who are my Who are my peers? So I did a blog post about the top ten women on LinkedIn. It took 156 people to find the top ten women, and then six months now? later, I top ten again. No, and that was Forbes back, top. That was back. That was back in 2000. Nine and so six months later it was 2010. I did it again and I had moved up the list to six. So now I was the sixth most connected woman on LinkedIn, and here are the other people. And I got there in less than 100 people this time. And then um, and then I did it once more um, three months later or six months later, and I was the third most connected woman on LinkedIn, and that was the highest that I that I rose. And and so I did this you know this whole series. Well. The the reason I'm now the chief branding officer for Alpha, the Association of Latino Professionals for America, and by the way, I'm not Latina, is because I met yeah. Charlie Garcia. Yeah, me neither. Anna De La Rosa. How about that? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, so Charlie is they're doing a spotlight on him in Huffington Post Latino about the top. They're doing a spotlight on him about being the most connected Latino on LinkedIn, and he was in the same quandary. How do I? Who are my peers? Who else is up here? So they wanted to do to name and identify the top ten or twenty, and so he reaches out to me and he's like, "How did you find the top ten women?" And so at the time, you could sort by you could just do a global search on LinkedIn, search with nothing, and it pulls up everybody on LinkedIn, and then you could sort by number of connections, and you can't do that now. And I said, then I I just counted who who the women were. I don't know how you're going to find the Latinos because. You know, you might have a Latino that's got the last name of Perkins. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, they did the research, though, and they found them, and that was pretty cool. That's so uh, cool. And that's how I met Charlie. And then that's how we – he sent It just me his, fell in place. Exactly. He sent me his book. We remained friends. I sent him referrals. He sent me referrals. And we there got you to, go. And then he said, hey, I got this thing I'm passionate about. Will you come help? And I said, I, I give, of course I'd come up. to chance to work with you. I mean, this is a guy – who you look at his LinkedIn profile and you're like, oh my God, people like this really exist. <laughs> I mean, he graduated at the top of his class from the U.S. US um, Air Force Academy. You know, he was a White House fellow. He's served four presidents in both parties. He's he's just done amazing things in his career, and and been named Entrepreneur of the Year nationally three times. I mean, That's people like this, not only do they exist, but they know who I am. See, that's amazing. And then it becomes a game because now, you know, just like you were rising to the top in all the different um, places that you were a part of on the teams and you worked and then, you know, LinkedIn, you were rising. Now you just have another step that you've gotten to, which is so amazing. Here's what's interesting now. As an executive, and I don't know if any other executive will ever tell you this, so I'm going to say it especially for, for women um, who are listening to this who hope one day to reach executive ranks themselves or who are currently in executive ranks. I was placed, because Charlie believed I was the person to do the job that needed to be done in that role, I was placed, I was chosen as an executive and put there. And now I have to continuously earn my place and maintain my level of of performance and integrity, and you know I cannot do it myself. I, I already spoke about a volunteer. I, I have a team of volunteers. There are 44 chapters in Alpha that are run by volunteer leadership. There are people out there who believe in it and are interested in branding, and they tell me if I if I have something errant, they'll send me a, a, t- a text message with an image of the Facebook page that has a bad post on it or, or, or misspelling somewhere or things like that. And you have to um, recognize from, from the people who directly report to you, to the people out in the field, to the customers, to the – you know, to the CEO, you know, being having to say I've got to change on a dime or I need to do this a little bit differently and being open to the fact that in that role you have to learn on the job. You cannot be an executive in today's world in, in the time of global companies that are not just global companies but micro businesses that are global companies and, and everything in between and the reality of the information that we have available to us and not learn on the job. If you believe you've made it, you will not 
be there long. Right. You cannot stagnate in that role. It's a constant daily um, movement. Practice. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, you can't and, and give up. You have to keep you know, going. Yeah. So or what do you say? Slack off. You can't slack you off. Can't you can't slack off up. at all. Yeah. So if you want to, if you aspire to be an executive, you have to aspire to be active. Verb be an executive and and maintain um, an openness to critique and a openness to not being afraid to be vulnerable to ask for help when you need it, to, you know, somebody once told me that vulnerability for me was easy because I have rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia. I mean, I I have pictures of of me on stage, um, sometimes in a wheelchair. I I was in a wheelchair a few weeks ago, and the next day I was walking. It was just a matter of, is my body going to work today? And and the level of pain that I'm in um, all the time, um, you know, I, I I already said I, I have people who are my sounding boards and say, hey, you're being harsh. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this email came, came across, you know, but y- you have to recognize that the uh, probably the most vulnerable people on the planet are executives. You cannot. That's how I sort of how I started getting rec- learning much more about the executive ranks was writing so many LinkedIn profiles um, and starting to do some for executives. You know, because of the attention to detail and the talking to the different stakeholders that would be impacted by the posting of an of an executive profile. And when executives started getting on LinkedIn, you can't just put something out there and hope it looks good. Oh yeah. Nope. You have to be. <laughs> Yeah, very, very particular. Especially, especially if you're in in marketing, uh-huh. you know, you're the chief marketing officer. You can't just, <laughs> you know, here. You let me call this after a while if you see something crazy. Exactly, and, and so you know, we we made sure I I got to it got to the point where I was serving a lot of executives. I've written over 300 executive profiles, and um and and they all are first person conversational. They all speak to the power of who that person is um, and why they are aligned with the brand that they are. Wouldn't it make sense for my own profile to um, to represent not just me, but who I work with? Yep. And, and, and make it look aligned? I mean, if it looks, if I've got a profile and it's all about me and, and about my dreams and my goals and, and what I'm trying to accomplish. And people look at the company page and they look like two completely different things. People yeah. are going to say, don't connect with, she's not going to be there long. Right, because it's not connection. There's no connection. Exactly. exactly. So, you know, who are, what community are you a part of that you need to consider that you're representing? Um, and it's kind of, I'm kind of scary, right? I mean, think about glass ceilings. Now I'm building glass walls. Um, but not in reality. What I want to do is just, you know, those places where you go in Tahiti and they've got the the rooms and they're open and it's blowing curtains and you can feel the breeze come through and that's the kind of of, of life you're looking for um, in in the online space. In, in reality, is, is to be able to have that kind of freedom, recognizing that nobody can take anything from you. Um, the 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 karma. It, of other people is how they treat you. Your karma is how you respond. Um, and, I, and I saw that um, on um, on Facebook just a little while ago. Actually, it was one of the twelve um, one of the twelve Murphy's laws on on in karma or something like that. I know, it, was, it was a pretty cool uh, thing. But but I thought about that. You know, I cannot. I actually can change how people treat me by how I respond to them. That's good. I, I can. I can feel sorry for them and say, wow, you, you must really be having a bad day. Is there anything I can do to help you? And it really throws people off when I say that to them because right. they're like, oh, my God. I mean, I didn't I, – it, what I just said did not put her under the ground like I intended it to. You know, I mean, even if even if they did it on purpose. Oh, right? my God. So I all, know. I do that, too. If they did do it on purpose, then they're like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be so harsh. And if yes, they did, exactly. They have to rethink, like, what's their strategy because that didn't work. Yes, exactly. And it's about being in tune and digging right. deep inside to know what you want out there. 
Right. And and honest to God, if somebody's going to try and bury me, I'm going to go down kicking and screaming. I don't want it to be easy for them. So I'm not going to make it easy for them. Um, and if I feel like lashing back out, thank God for Internet and not real-time communication because right. I, can, I, can, I can write. I, I literally have been known to disconnect my computer from the internet while I was while I was um, composing a reply email uh, because I I didn't want to accidentally hit send you know and and have it go out like that so first I write how I feel then yes. I tone it down and then I make it you know not politically correct and and I'm saying this saying you got to keep it real right but but the, the to a point thought is my my first visceral reaction allows me to get it out of my system and and share that 